Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this chat and conversation with Professor Jeffrey Sachs as we launch his new book, uh, The Ages of Globalization. Delighted so many of you have joined from around the world. Uh, it really is one of the silver linings uh, of this digital online that we are able to do this. And we're very sorry Jeff isn't with us in Oxford, uh, joining us from New York, uh, but delighted so many of you have been able to do so as well. I'm Ian Golden. I'm a professor of globalization and development uh, at Oxford University, and I was the founding director of the Oxford Martin School, and now run a couple of programs within the school. Jeff, as many of you know, uh, is university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Uh, he directed the Earth Institute there from 2002 until 2016. And in addition to his many, many accolades, uh, he has been engaged and really is a model uh, to me of what an academic can do in terms of combining thought leadership with action leadership. Uh, Jeffrey has uh, been at the forefront of thinking on development, but he's also been at the forefront of doing and making sure that actions get translated into words with a very deep commitment uh, to development over many, many years. I first met him uh, when he was a professor at Harvard University, where he received his BA, MA, and PhD. Uh, he subsequently moved uh, to uh, Columbia in 2002 to run the Earth Institute. He's the director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the commissioner of the UN Broadband Commission for Development. He's been an advisor to three secretary generals of the UN and serves as the um, SDG's advocate uh, on development. He is someone who has worked in many, many places and thought very deeply about many issues, but I didn't uh, think that he had a 5,000 year sweep of understanding of globalization until I read his magisterial new book, uh, The Ages of Globalization. Jeff, congratulations. It's a huge <laughs> sweep through history. It's helped me understand globalization uh, better and even as a professor who's worked on it for many, many years um, and uh, given me all sorts of new insights. But why, let's begin this conversation by perhaps you just giving a 10 minute introduction uh, for those that haven't been fortunate enough to read the book yet to the book and what you'll see below uh, on this webcast, you can click on that and order Jeff's book while he's speaking. There, there you go. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining in. This book uh, was born at Oxford. Uh, it uh, was uh, first uh, delivered as a series of lectures at the School of Geography and Environment. And I want to uh, thank especially Gordon Clark, who uh, the uh, wonderful uh, leader, uh, faculty leader of uh, that school for so many years, a, a great friend and was my host for those lectures at Oxford in 2017. And those lectures gave me the chance to uh, put on a paper and in a coherent way, I hope, uh, themes that have uh, been running through my head for uh, the last 35 years. Uh, I began advising governments in 1985, uh, starting in Bolivia. And Bolivia was notable not only for its macroeconomic imbalances with a hyperinflation that had reached tens of thousands percent per year, but also for a landlocked country uh, in uh, the uh, high Altiplano of the Andean region, at least the capital uh, city, uh, La Paz. And uh, it forced me really for the first time to think about uh, geography and development, it's so basic. But uh, I went to uh, a PhD program and undergraduate uh, thinking that countries were basically uh, listed by alphabetical order. You know, I didn't think about countries uh, on maps like the wonderful book of maps uh, that Professor Golden has just produced. I thought about countries as having national economies with national income accounts. Uh, but when you're up at 12,000 or 14,000 feet above sea level, you do think about geography. When you're in a landlocked country, you think about geography. Uh, when I began working in Poland uh, a few years uh, later in the post-communist transition, that long, flat, 
plain that connects Poland uh, with the Germany uh, to uh, the west and with Russia to the east was also a defining uh, determinant of Poland's history and fate. In fact, Poland was so easily invaded and divided so many times because of its geographic accessibility uh, to two uh, giant powers uh, on either side. Well, over the course of uh, 35 years of working in all parts of the world, the roles of geography in shaping development uh, came more and more uh, to uh, my thoughts and my mind. But how those uh, geographic factors interact with two other factors is pivotal. Geography changes depending on technology. Uh, a landlocked country in an age of the internet is very different from a landlocked country without the internet. Uh, any country that has horses is very different from uh, countries that or places that do not, especially after 3000 BC when horses have been domesticated. Uh, before that, it didn't make all that much difference because people were basically eating horses rather than uh, riding on them or using them for animal traction. So the interaction of geography uh, with technology, with institutions, which is a rather core staple of uh, economic uh, analysis, uh, for me has been a shaping theme. And in this book, I look at the interaction of those great three thematic areas, geography, technology, and institutions, to look at the dynamics of globalization across time. And I in, in a way artificially, but I think uh, with uh, some uh, useful insight, then put globalization into a number of distinct ages that are paced strongly by either uh, uh, geographical change like fundamental climate change, the birth of uh, civilization with the Holocene uh, 10,000 uh, years ago, or paced by deep technological changes and their interactions with uh, institutional change. And uh, the uh, result is seven ages of globalization. I make the argument, which I didn't really appreciate fully 35 years ago, that we've always been globalized in some sense uh, as uh, long distance interactions and interdependence of human societies. Uh, this goes back to the first migrations, the Paleolithic, uh, migrations uh, of uh, anatomically modern humans out of Africa, uh, roughly 50 to 70,000 years ago, uh, to the birth of uh, civilization <clears throat> with the Holocene and agriculture, to what I call the equestrian age, the age of the horse, <clears throat> because I regard the horse in economic history uh, as at least as important as the automobile and, and uh, transport of the last two centuries fundamental game changer in power, in the military, in the reach of empire, in the scale of uh, polities, uh, in uh, the productivity of economic life. But some places didn't have the horse and others did, and that was a tremendous shaper uh, of uh, world dynamics. From there is the classic age, the Roman Empire, the Han Empire, uh, the other great classic uh, empires, uh, uh, the Persian Empire, the Mauryan Empire, uh, the uh, 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 initial uh, Islamic uh, empires uh, uh, starting in the seventh century uh, and so on. The next great stage is uh, what Adam Smith famously called the two most uh, important events in the history of mankind, the discovery of the sea routes from Europe to the Americas and from Europe to Asia around the Cape of Good Hope a part of the world Ian uh, knows very well. Uh, and that uh, gave us uh, globalization in the sense we know it today, global scale multinational enterprises, of which the first was the East Indies Company uh, of London, and the second was the Dutch East Indies Company, uh, founded in 1602. That created multinational global scale enterprise. Sixth uh, phase uh, was with the birth of the steam engine. Uh, I think conveniently dated uh, to another famous date, 1776. That's when Adam Smith wrote uh, his great book. Uh, it's uh, when uh, the uh, fall and decline, the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbons uh, was written. 
and it was uh, when the uh, Declaration of Independence of the United States uh, was, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, also promulgated. Uh, so a pivotal year. It gave rise to the Industrial Age, an age highly differentiated in power uh, to an important extent by who had coal and accessible coal and who did not because now the steam engine was uh, the primary uh, driving force of industrialization. And then I argue that we're in the new seventh age of globalization today, the digital age. And while well, the book was written, uh, obviously, before COVID-19, uh, the last weekend before going to press, uh, I had time to add uh, a, uh, a preface uh, to the book uh, about COVID-19, uh, yet another epidemic as shaper of globalization as the Black Death was and uh, other uh, pandemic diseases. But I think one of the things that we'll remember 2024 was the dramatic acceleration of digitalization of the world economy. We're uh, half online, uh, half uh, in brick and mortar. Uh, the online uh, part of the world economy is soaring. Uh, the brick and mortar part of the world economy has been in a state of near collapse. Uh, it's a shocking uh, change, uh, redistribution of wealth and income. Uh, and I think a shaper of things to come because we won't go back to uh, the way things were in 2019, even if we do get a vaccine that quickly puts this uh, uh, pandemic to rest. And sadly, uh, the most recent news is uh, even then uh, the, uh, the antibody uh, response uh, might be short lived and we may be living with this uh, for quite a long time. Uh, but in any event, we'll be living with the digital age for years to come. And I think that that is a great definer of the new age of globalization. Final point that I would make is each age has had its power structures, its geopolitics, its winners and its losers. And uh, our age of uh, the digital globalization is no different. It is already giving rise to dangerous geopolitical tensions most notably uh, between the US and China. Uh, but I think uh, the digital age, by shifting power structures, by opening up uh, new avenues of warfare, cyber warfare, surveillance, fake news, is a destabilizing force, uh, as well as an economically disruptive force uh, for the good and for the bad. So. That, that is the, the shape, uh, shape of, uh, of the book and uh, seven minutes uh, for 70 years. <laughs> yes, um, thank you, covering uh, 5,000 years in, in seven minutes um, and uh, admirably so. Uh, I was very struck a long time ago when you wrote your seminal paper on the interface between geography uh, and institutions and development, um, which got me to think fresh the about about development prospects then and i know many others felt the same way um and i think this book similarly does that not least because the way you think about globalization is very very different for many people globalization is just a dirty word uh which started um recently but you see it as a much longer process as you said from the earliest migration indeed what defines us as humans is our ability uh, to globalize uh, which makes us pretty unique as a species. Um, so um, how do you define globalization? When I was advising Bolivia, uh, I thought that I was watching globalization take place for the first time. Yeah. Then uh, I learned a little bit more history and was reminded of uh, some of my classes and so forth. And then I thought, well, no, it's really taking place for the second time because the 19th century was the age of free trade after all, following uh, the end of mercantilism uh, and uh, the, uh, 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 the prescriptions of Adam Smith. Then uh, I thought a little bit more about it. Well, uh, that's not exactly right. Uh, even mercantilism was a form of globalization after all. That was the age of empire. Uh, uh, and you could say that the Spanish empire was the first global uh, empire and the Portuguese and the Pope dividing the world between the two in 1494 
uh, in the Treaty of Tordesillas. Uh, so uh, it kept get, getting pushed back. Uh, then, of course, uh, we learned from uh, archaeologists uh, and from historians more and more that uh, the Han and the China and, and the uh, the Roman empires were trading. Uh, we had the Silk Route revived uh, by uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in uh, the form of the Belt and Road Initiative, but completely uh, with a view towards uh, 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 the ancient role of uh, the Silk Roads in linking East and West. Uh, we were reminded uh, of uh, uh, even the Mongol Empire, the largest land empire in uh, the history of the world, uh, which we don't think about usually in too kindly uh, and uh, warm and fuzzy ways, but it, it actually was a period of massive trade from East to West because it was under uh, the safety, as it were, of uh, Mongol rule. And so for me, the dates just get uh, got pushed back farther and farther and farther. And then uh, I thought that a plausible definition of globalization is long distance interaction uh, of uh, societies through uh, exchanges of goods, services, people, ideas, uh, technologies, alphabets, uh, and so forth. And uh, in that sense, uh, we've always been globalized, uh, at, at least uh, for tens of thousands of years. Ancient Paleolithic settlements uh, find uh, remarkably uh, gemstones or uh, objects of art, work, uh, jewelry uh, that are based on substances, minerals, uh, precious gems, and so forth that must have come from hundreds or thousands of miles away uh, in an era when that was basically by raft uh, or by foot. Uh, and uh, so we know that we've been engaged in very long distance exchange and of course migration uh, since uh, the very start of, uh, uh, of uh, the exodus from, uh, from Africa uh, that uh, was uh, the, the birth of the settlement of uh, the world by anatomically modern humans as I said, somewhere between 50 and 7,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have a little conversation with Jeff, and I encourage you to post your questions. And also do note that this is being recorded. Um, so if you're posing questions, um, uh, they will be part of the record. Um, so Jeff, globalization for you is this long-term historical process. It basically defines humanity over uh, its existence. Um, and I guess you, for that reason, you would see it as both a force for tremendous good and progress, um, bringing civilizations into contact with each other, leapfrogging, as well as a source of immense danger, um, which we see through pandemics, but we've seen in many, many other cascading shocks, what I call um, the butterfly defect of globalization in, in, a, in a previous book. How, how do you see those two positives and negatives interacting? And, and do you think that the balance of positive and negative has changed? And if so, is that because of policy, um, like we can stop the bads? Uh, or is this sort of an inevitable and harvest the goods? Or is this just sort of an inevitable ebb and flow of good and bad? What, what, do, we, what do we take away from 7,000 years of, or 5,000 years of, of observation? <laughs> I, I'm going to read, if I can, uh, my favorite uh, um, excerpt from The Wealth of Nations. Uh, and uh, it'll take a couple minutes, but I think we have time. But uh, it is, for me, uh, the quintessence of Adam Smith's wisdom and uh, decency, but it's also exactly your question. Uh, so I'm quoting, uh, the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Their consequences have already been very great, but in the short period of between two and three centuries which have elapsed since these discoveries were made, it is impossible that the whole extent of their consequences can have been seen. What benefits or misfortunes to mankind may hereafter result from these great events, no human wisdom can foresee. Now here's the point. By uniting in some measure the most distant parts of the world, by enabling them to relieve one another's wants, to increase one another's enjoyments, and to encourage one another's industry, 
their general tendency would seem to be beneficial. To the natives, however, both of the East and West Indies, all the commercial benefits which can have resulted from those events have been sunk and lost in the dreadful misfortunes which they have occasioned. So what is Smith saying? Adam Smith is saying uh, global trade should be a win-win, you know, uh, because his basic uh, theory, which I think is the right theory, uh, that global trade enables each part of the world to help meet the wants and the needs of other parts of the world should be mutually beneficial. That's the gains from trade through specialization. We study it from the first day. Uh, Paul Samuelson gave uh, the most uh, elegant uh, proofs of it. David Ricardo helped us to understand it uh, in the early 19th century. It's true. Globalization is a good. Uh, we can, I can have my coffee, which I'm not going to get out of a Central Park uh, uh, coffee uh, farm. I'm going to get it uh, from Java or Ethiopia or Colombia or Brazil or Vietnam. Uh, thanks goodness, I love my coffee. Uh, so globalization should be a good thing. And yet it has often been a terrible thing. And why a terrible thing? What Smith talks about was the unequal power of the conquerors uh, when they uh, arrived uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in the ports of the Indian Ocean in, uh, in uh, the East Indies. But he didn't know it was 1776, 100 years before Pasteur and Koch, that what the uh, conquistadors brought was not only their weapons, but even more importantly, they brought their pathogens. They brought smallpox, uh, they brought uh, measles, they brought other killer diseases because the old world was steeped in a pathogenic uh, cauldron. Uh, many children died, but by the time you reached adulthood, you had adult immunity, uh, or uh, most did, you could carry it to the new world and end up destroying the population, uh, the indigenous populations, which was wiped out to perhaps 90% in large parts of the Americas, mainly by disease, also, by suppression, slavery, uh, disenfranchisement of land, uh, and uh, other uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, conquest. But the point is, globalization brings together this underlying promise of mutual benefit, and especially of sharing know-how, because the great, 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 great benefit of know-how is that it is non-rival. Once we know how to do something better, Everyone can use it better in principle. Uh, and so sharing know-how is such a fundamental benefit of globalization that I think in the end of the day, it has to be given first pride of place in the answer. But globalization brings together uh, societies that have unequal military force, different pathogens, uh, different uh, cultures, misunderstandings, uh, and we are pretty hardwired, I believe, uh, to hate the other or to be uh, at least primed so that one can hate the other. So globalization brings conflict, uh, and it has long brought conflict. Uh, in this sense, the, the general history is such a mess of, of bloody-mindedness that uh, what the ocean age that Smith is talking about brought, among other things, was uh, the mass uh, transatlantic slave trade. Uh, it brought the uh, middle passage of 14 million Africans uh, to uh, the slave plantations of Brazil, the Caribbean, uh, and uh, the United States and other parts of the Americas. A horrendous, horrendous crime against humanity, but absolutely part of globalization. And so, how do you make the balance? It is like you said, it's the balance of human history. But what impresses me also is that it's really only since uh, the 16th century that we now have the idea of the whole world in our heads. Uh, when I recently uh, read Herodotus, uh, I was reminded that uh, the extent of the known world for the Greeks or of the world for the Greeks, basically ended around the Indus River. Uh, there were some uh, people living in India. There was no sense 
for Herodotus that there was China or East Asia at all, not even a hint of it, not even a, a tale or a story. It was just the, the, the notion of the world was so circumscribed still. But since the 1500s, we've seen the whole world. And since the end of the 18th century, really with Immanuel Kant, in my view, and his essay, 1795 on perpetual peace, we began to think about a world that could live together in peace as a concept. Uh, and uh, maybe you could go back to Isaiah uh, in the Bible, uh, where Isaiah says uh, that uh, 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 that the sword shall be uh, beat in, into plowshares uh, and, and uh, swords into plowshares and Oh my God! <laughs> I was and, the other <laughs> and the other into pruning hooks. Uh, it'll come to me. Uh, in any event, Isaiah had the idea of a world at peace, but Immanuel Kant really gave us the first modern conception. And when I was writing this, I had not been aware of the special role that uh, Jeremy Bentham played in laying out uh, systematically for the first time the ideas of international law that could underpin that peace. A hundred years later, that gave birth to the League of Nations. That was a tragically stillborn institution because of uh, the uh, fairly regularly timed stupidity of my own country, the United States. Uh, after 1945, the US did much better uh, under Franklin Roosevelt's vision and helped to give birth to the UN. This year, we're at the 75th anniversary of the UN. And my answer to your question, bottom line is, Globalization can be win-win if it is paired with institutions like the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because then we tame the power structure and we get the best. But it is ironic also that globalization has long brought global disease, and we're experiencing that again this year, globalization spread COVID-19 within days to the whole world, uh, most likely from Western China, uh, from Wuhan to uh, Italy uh, within a few hours. Uh, the Black Death, another such famed uh, and devastating example, spread in 16 years from 1331 in Western China best guess by uh, the historian William McNeil to 1347 arriving in Italy. Then globalization took 16 years for the passage. This globalization took 16 hours. And so this is the flip side of intense interconnectedness uh, at uh, the uh, speed of the digital age. You were finishing um, the book, or you, you held the book to finish it uh, because of COVID-19, just as, as I, uh, with Rob Maga, did with Terra Incognita. Um, but do you, you know, when you look back at these big shocks that have happened, the financial crisis most recently, which was the super spreading of contagion, uh, the Spanish flu, uh, and previous shocks, do you think that that COVID-19 is going to allow us to better manage globalized? Does it teach us that we're interconnected and we need global governance, we need a WHO that's effective? Or um, from your reading of the history, uh, is the jury still out on that? Or even worse, and I hope it's not the case, that actually it leads to more division, uh, which, um, which would be a pretty dismal thought. My uh, philosophy about this is basically like the prisoner's dilemma. You know, the prisoner's dilemma teaches us that uh, there is an equilibrium, maybe even the Nash equilibrium uh, of uh, defection, defection, where you lose the gains of cooperation. But there's also the possibility of cooperation. And in fact, that cooperation can be sustained either through iterative play that you know, this isn't the last time we're gonna do this, so we ought to cooperate with each other, or maybe by our hardwired uh, desire to cooperate that uh, overcomes our selfish uh, Nash equilibrium uh, vision of uh, trying to take advantage of the other. Whatever it is, people cooperate a lot, 
and they cheat a lot. And we know that there are two different outcomes. And I think when you take the scale of a dyadic two-person prisoner's dilemma and you see society as uh, facing such dilemmas, pro-social or anti-social dilemmas all the time, the right uh, point is to say, God, we could make a mess of things and that mess could be contagious because if everybody's fighting everybody else, if it's a, uh, if, if it's a war of all against all, uh, we're, we better fight too. Or the cooperative outcome where we learn some manners, some decency, abide by the law, if nothing else, because everyone else is. Uh, so we are acting as so-called conditional cooperators is also uh, a possibility. And my view of uh, history is uh, more or less like that, that both kinds of outcomes are possible. Uh, we can be wise and cooperative and farsighted. We can be bloody-minded. We can go through uh, decades of peace. <laughs> and then uh, instead of learning the lessons of preserving the peace, such as in Europe from uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, onward for at least decades, uh, ending up again in the disaster of World War I uh, for no reason, basically, except uh, 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 the players uh, played the non-cooperative equilibrium rather than the cooperative equilibrium. There is no deep reason for World War I. Uh, there were no uh, causal elements, I would argue, other than events. Uh, one event after another uh, that gives the TikTok history, but no deep explanation, because that was a time of great progress, prosperity, technological advance, and we blew it. Uh, and that led to, oh my God, disaster, deaths, uh, and a second world war, and, and so on. Uh, so on the question, what will we learn? We can't view that well, if, you're a if you are a better, you can view that as a spectator sport. You can bet long or short on humanity. Uh, and uh, many people take that view. If you're an activist like I am, uh, you can't afford to sit back and say, oh, we're going to learn because we're stupid. So we may not learn at all. We may uh, end up like we did after the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 and then squabble so badly for the next 20 years that we ended up in. World War II, or we could end up uh, as we did in 1945. Now, even then, that wasn't so great uh, because <laughs> we nearly blew ourselves up in thermonuclear war uh, by 1962. But we need, therefore, a constructive approach to your question. We need to act to learn. Uh, we need to construct a peaceful approach. That's why I'm so much on edge right now, uh, hoping that we're going to turn out of power the psychopathic president of the United States, because he doesn't understand anything about cooperation. His only mode of operation is the defect mode. So he understands defecting of cheating on the other. He doesn't have an idea that there's an alternative possibility because you need to be able to peer into the future somehow for an iterative, cooperative uh, equilibrium in a prisoner's dilemma, and he just doesn't get it. So uh, ask me that question next week uh, after November 3, and I'll give you a, a, a more uh, refined answer on that about what's going to happen. If uh, for some uh, horrible uh, reason Trump holds onto power, I'd be extremely worried. Uh, if he's turned out of power, uh, I'll be much more hopeful if he's turned out of power by a large uh, margin, I will be profoundly relieved uh, and feel a lot better about my country. Uh, I'm very worried right now. Yeah, I think the whole world is. Um, if, uh, if the whole world it, it, vote, it, it, we it, wouldn't it, have the problem. <laughs> except a lot of malevolent forces. But um, is there something, and this will be my last question because I see there are 24 in the box. Um, is there something about this digital age that can make us hopeful? Because unlike every pre previous age of globalization, we really do understand a lot more now. We can see the world at the macroscopic to the microscopic level. 
Uh, we know that the, the, if we carry on our actions, we're going to be heading to, you know, out of control climate change that Miami, LA will be underwater amongst other places, um, Mumbai, Jakarta, London. Um, is there something about our knowledge and the fact that we are more connected? We see Black Lives Matter spreading to over 100 countries uh, in a couple of days. We see the MUTU movement. We see Greta Thunberg. We see the ability of the combination of science and action to globalize. Of course, we also see fake news and anti-vaccination movements. But it feels to me that this power of understanding combined with mobilization is very different to anything that's ever happened in any prior age of globalization and also that the stakes are higher than they've ever been we really can blow the world up now in ways that we couldn't before and business as usual will blow it up uh, i think we're seeing not least through climate change escalating pandemics etc so does that i mean is there a sense that 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 this could be the final age of globalization if we don't get this right. Um, and that that this long, long trajectory that you outline is coming to some apex. And hopefully there has been a learning, not least in, in the last decades. One of my favorite uh, quotations is of John F. Kennedy in, in his inaugural address uh, when he said, for the world is very different now Mankind holds in its mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And uh, he was speaking January 20th, 1961, but he was really expressing the existential reality of the modern age, which is that even as of 1961, technology was uh, so advanced that we could end poverty everywhere or because of thermonuclear weapons, we could end human life everywhere. And uh, Kennedy was a, a rationalist. He was uh, uh, a very uh, well-meaning and, and uh, very eloquent uh, and, and visionary leader, but uh, his actions and blunders combined with actions and blunders of his counterpart in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, led to the closest uh, scrape with the uh, total nuclear annihilation that we ever have seen on October 26th, I think it is, uh, 1962. What happened, of course, is uh, uh, that from one misstep to the next, the US invasion of Cuba and the Bay of Pigs in 1961, Khrushchev's uh, harebrained idea to put uh, uh, nuclear warheads into Cuba in 1962, uh, these two superpowers uh, approached a nuclear confrontation. And then what they didn't know, and, and this is a, a story uh, told in some really powerful recent uh, historical writing, uh, what they didn't know uh, was uh, a moment uh, came when a uh, nuclear armed submarine of uh, the Soviet fleet just about launched a uh, nuclear-tipped warhead, a 15-kiloton nuclear-tipped warhead that would almost surely have triggered thermonuclear war. And he was countermanded at the final moment by one superior officer uh, on the submarine. It's a miracle we survived. And so we are in a tripwire age still. We have 6,400 nuclear warheads in the United States and Donald Trump is president. It's unbelievable. Uh, and this is a, that is an existential truth. Now, th the fact of the matter is uh, what you say is completely right. We know so much more even than 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Uh, every week when I get science and nature, uh, my favorite arrival on Friday, uh, when the two magazines, hard copies still arrive, and uh, I can read uh, maybe a quarter of it or a half of it uh, and kind of understand uh, uh, much of it. It's unbelievable the pace of knowledge that uh, we have uh, coming every week, not every year, every week, huge breakthroughs, renewable energy, quantum computing, uh, new ways to manage expert systems, artificial intelligence, you name it. 
But then we have this dingbat as president who's in, not only an ignoramus, but uh, psychologically imbalanced. And you're reminded, um, how can this go together? And so uh, another uh, favorite quotation of mine, which <laughs> so profoundly expresses reality for me, is what uh, E.O. Wilson, the great uh, biologist, uh, my guru, uh, uh, tremendous inspiration and friend of mine at Harvard, wrote uh, in a preface to one of my books uh, several years ago, uh, he said uh, uh, that, so we have entered the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technologies. And so we have to remember that we're operating on three different timelines. One is our makeup as human beings which drives us, our prejudices, our biases, our decision-making formed on the African savanna 100,000 years ago. Then we have our institutions. In the United States, our constitution uh, was uh, promulgated uh, in 1787 in Philadelphia. It is tremendously out of date. You would never write it this way if you were preparing it in the year uh, 2020. We have originalist Supreme Court uh, appointees like uh, the one that came in today, who thinks you should read the original text. It's something like fundamentalists reading the Bible, uh, as if you're going to find the truth uh, through a fundamentalist reading of the Bible. Well, they want to read a 1787 document as a fundamentalist document. It's a nonsense. We're living in the 21st century, and we better get with it uh, in that way. And then we have technology that reached the Moore's law doubling speeds of, uh, uh, of 18 to 24 months, basically since 1960 till today. So uh, 30 plus doublings uh, of uh, our digital computational connective uh, power. Uh, every few hours, we're producing more data now than uh, basically uh, data that was produced in human history. Don't quote me, it's not exactly that way, but uh, it's, uh, it's that kind of uh, geometric pace. Uh, the amount of terabytes uh, that, that we're producing is striking. Probably every few days now is more than all the data, say up to the year 2016 or 2017 in, in, uh, in human history, all the information uh, flows. So we don't have the institutions and our mindsets catching up with this. If we did, we'd say, my God, we've got it made. The computers will and the machines will do our work. We can sit and have coffee all day uh, and uh, you know, have a great time and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the quality of lives, time to think, time to learn, time to help each other while the machines do the grudge work, uh, grunge work. Uh, but whether we're uh, smart enough not to turn this knowledge into cyber warfare, uh, this is uh, really the matter. I recently listened to some NATO generals talking about artificial intelligence as, as, as the military option. And instead of talking about trying to find some kind of limit to an AI arms race with China, they said, we're going to beat China at this. Okay, that is primitivism uh, that could endanger all of us. Um, there's so much to to chat about always, Jeff, with you, and we haven't even got to development or climate change and, and all the SDGs yet. Um, but I I certainly feel that we are in this Renaissance moment, and you know I, I argued in Age of Discovery that uh, we need to to learn from that huge creativity, but that ended in disaster, not least the killing of of Native Americans, but also of course. Um, uh, huge setbacks in Europe and the burning of books by Savonarola, who was the 15th century Donald Trump. Um, exactly. And, and by the way, Ian, uh, it's interesting. I, I've spent, a, for random reasons, quite a bit of time with the decade of the 1510s. Uh, yeah. 500 years ago, I was asked to give some 500th anniversary talks, yeah. for example, yeah. of uh, Thomas More's Utopia. Yeah. That 10 years was extraordinary because you had Erasmus, you had uh, Thomas More, you had Machiavelli, uh, you had uh, you, you had the first heliocentric uh, uh, manuscripts of Copernicus, Copernicus. and so yeah. on. 
Uh, it ended, uh, of course, with Luther and the 95 Theses, uh, and then uh, <laughs> the progression of Europe into uh, religious wars yep. for the next uh, 100 plus yep. years. And so uh, genius and breakthrough does not guarantee yep. heat. Yeah, yep. That, that, that's what Age of Discovery is about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, we've got 28 questions and uh, 10 minutes, so uh, let's be fair to to, to people. Uh, the, now, people, have been, you can vote for the questions, and I'm going to have to group them, so I encourage you to, to, to vote so I can um, select the questions that are of the most interest. The first question is, every country makes use of whatever natural resources it is endowed with, from the point of view of Brazil the, uh, and the president, the Amazon is Brazil's, not yours. Um, if other countries want to enjoy the benefits of rainforest, shouldn't they compensate Brazil for not cutting down its rainforests? Who should be, bear the costs of saving the Amazon? Eight, nine votes. Uh, good. I, I, I think uh, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, Norway has been pragmatic. It set up uh, an Amazon fund. Germany contributed to it. Uh, and uh, I would like other countries to contribute to it so that we uh, actually do help to co-fund the stabilization of a biome that is so critical for world survival and is so much on the edge. Uh, by the way, global warming itself, even without deforestation, could destroy uh, the Amazon. So uh, I am in agreement that we need some sharing of funding and responsibility, but uh, let's not destroy the Amazon. Um, Prof Sachs, we expect the UN to revise SDG targets and the deadlines as COVID 19s continue to be threatened um, in this, uh, continue to threaten most of the goals. Uh, how does COVID 19 impact on this, and what's the UN going to do about it? Well, first of all, with COVID-19, very briefly, you know, if we were smart, rational, uh, led uh, properly, we would have uh, suppressed this pandemic already, even without the vaccine. And I just point you to the experiences of China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, among others. All of them use public health means contact tracing, uh, ample testing, uh, quarantine and isolation, face masks, the whole package to get this virus suppressed. Uh, because of Trump, Bolsonaro, AMLO, others, uh, other uh, populist leaders, uh, we failed to do that uh, in other places. And our freedom-loving societies in the US and Europe uh, behave badly uh, in this, uh, many people. I don't want to wear face masks. That's a denial of my freedom and so forth uh, without the sense of social responsibility. But we need to stop the pandemic. Uh, a vaccine would help. Uh, it may not be sufficient. Good behavior, uh, proper etiquette, a proper social regard is absolutely essential. Honest government uh, is essential. Technical advice is essential. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, stop uh, that theme for the moment because uh, once we stop the pandemic, uh, then we're going to see we've got the scarred world economy. What do we do? Then we're going to have to have significant public investment led recovery. The good news Europe has adopted a European Green Deal. China just announced net zero emissions by 2060 as the uh, as the formative uh, basic goal. Japan yesterday announced uh, reaching zero by 2050. If Joe Biden is elected president, he is committed to reaching zero by 2050. Now, if you put a public investment-led program around that, that's a lot of recovery, a rapid shift to uh, renewable energy. It's lots of jobs. If we connect it to Another call of the Secretary General of the UN uh, in recent months, universal access to broadband, which is also technically easily within reach. Then we can expand rapidly telemedicine, distance education, e-payments, e-banking, e-governance, and other services. We actually could jump back and even leapfrog the earlier trajectory through deployment of digital 
and a green recovery strategy. So before we start shifting uh, the timelines and the goalposts, I want us to have a very serious look at how we can accelerate by undertaking the kind of public investment led sustainable development that we should be undertaking. Now, November 3 will determine a lot about this. Again, if Biden's elected, the US will be all in on this. He's promised $4 trillion of, I'm sorry, $2 trillion of spending uh, over the first four years uh, towards this uh, green recovery. And then I think we'll be in a position actually to bring about a real acceleration to the SDGs. Um, great. Well, that leads to the next question, which um, I guess the answer is, uh, we'll, I'll tell you next week. Is the, is the USA a failed democracy? The US is a deeply divided country that has uh, these divisions with very deep roots. Uh, the US is a, a colonial settlement enterprise. Uh, it arrived uh, Europeans and basically uh, uh, basically English uh, settlers uh, arrived uh, to the eastern seaboard of North America and uh, battled their way across North America, suppressing, killing Native Americans and enslaving millions and millions of African Americans. We've never fully overcome this legacy by any means. Uh, our apartheid state in the United States was in full swing between uh, 1865, the end of the Civil War, to the 1965. But I don't mean apartheid in a, with quotation marks, I mean apartheid. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful book, uh, I just wrote a Project Syndicate op-ed uh, citing it today, if you want to take a look, called The Color of Law, which shows how deeply racism was embodied in US structures, deeply embodied in US structures for 100 years. Now, Trump is, I hope, the last stage of this uh, institutionalized deep racism in the United States. He represents, he is a racist, and he represents uh, this part of America. Uh, he represents a white America that resists uh, the broader social democratic tendencies and the tensions in the U.S. rose significantly because uh, our demographics uh, are changing uh, to uh, much more people of color, uh, more Hispanics, uh, uh, much more Asian Americans, and so on. And this is what our culture wars are heavily about. Not only that, but to an important extent. So America's in the midst of culture wars. Our political institutions are also wounded uh, because the, the constitutional design is really out of date. Do not have presidents in your country. Have parliaments, believe me. Much better idea. It wasn't so clear in 1787, but it's absolutely clear today. You should not have people like King Donald, uh, even with the possibility of having this kind of power. It's not a savior to have democracy. We know the history of Weimar Germany, but still, it is uh, more secure to have a parliamentary than a presidential system. But we also became a plutocracy uh, over the last 40 years. This election cycle will involve more than $10 billion of uh, outlays by the candidates. Think of all the corruption involved with that. It's massive. Uh, and so we've got a lot of cleaning up to do in the United States. I just want the United States to be a cooperative, peaceful country uh, abiding by international law. I don't see it as the world's leader in any sense right now. We've got too much to heal domestically anyway, but we don't need a leader country. What we need is cooperation based on multilateral principles, most fundamentally based on the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and our generation's instantiation of that, which is the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. I, we've got four minutes left. So very quickly, Jeff, um, what's got four votes from Darshan at the University of Houston is how can countries aspire to grow 
uh, in a growing protectionist environment? Um, and is there just going to be a war of tariff barriers? And just very brief answer to that, and then we'll wrap up, I'm afraid. Yeah, wh when we had the last full out uh, trade war, which started in the 1930s uh, with the Smoot Hawley tariff in the United States, uh, trade disintegrated, uh, the Great Depression was exacerbated, and it took us, after a war, it took us decades to come back to uh, getting the gains of open trade. We should not go into a trade war. Uh, this is a, a case, again, of a ignorant president uh, and uh, a, a, a very unnerved uh, political establishment in the United States, uh, just uh, terrified of China, uh, but phenomenally too much afraid. Uh, we should uh, get Trump out of power uh, and then go back to a WTO-based international trading system. Of course, it needs some updating, but uh, I think uh, open trade is our best call, but it's got to be combined with redistribution of income, both within countries and internationally, to make sure that losers are absolutely compensated uh, and help to become winners. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And and would add, actually, I think we need to be thinking about carbon adjustments as well, because what we don't want to be doing, which is what the UK is, is going to zero carbon domestically and becoming the biggest importer. In fact, our carbon content of our products and services has increased, uh, although we're very proud of the fact that we're moving to fully renewable energy production. Um, Absolutely. And what we also don't want is countries <laughs> going to zero internally and exporting their carbon. Well, that, yeah, that's right. As oil, many oil and gas. That's the other side of it. Which country. many states like in the US do. <laughs> yeah, Canada, US and Australia. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Jeff, as always, it's been a huge pleasure. I know it has been for the many hundreds of people that have joined us from all around the world. I'm terribly sorry that we can't now go for a drink and dinner together in, in Oxford as we would normally do or in New York. Uh, but a pleasure to see you. And really, uh, I want to encourage people to look at and buy uh, Jeff's inspiring book, Ages of Globalization. Uh, having worked on globalization for three decades, I learned a huge amount and sure, uh, all of you uh, will too. Um, do tweet about this if you found it interesting, um, and you'll find the Oxford Martin School, my and Jeff's hashtags around and other social media. Oxford Martin School is devoted to interdisciplinary thinking on the big challenges of the future. <laughs> this book uh, exemplifies, and Jeff's work, what we're all about. Um, there's a lot of other events, and I encourage you to look at the Oxford Martin School's events uh, page. There's a whole series of events in the coming weeks, many of them focused on COVID and its implications and what to do about it, including by people who are associated with the vaccine in, in, um, in Oxford. So do have a look at that. Thanks to all of you for joining. And thanks, Jeff. I know your schedule is packed. Thanks so much to you uh, so for great being to part be of this. Th yeah. Thank you. And thanks right. to everybody that was joining today. Take care. All, right. all the best.